Hi, Dr. Rubin. Hi, Amira. How are you doing? I'm good. Good to see you. You moved this to a time when I can join someone. <laughs> I see Iman on the line. Just yeah. wait. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Iman. Um, Shaban, you want to test your screen sharing? Um, no. no, so I think you need to uh, enable, enable screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can try now. Okay. Yeah, that's oh, the presenter. Okay. So I think we can formally start. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. Let me introduce you first. Hi, everyone. Welcome to 110th uh, Stanford Media Group Exchange session. This week, we have Mohammed Chaban here with us to talk about his work on AI driven cell phenotyping in highly multiplex mm -hmm. regions. Dr. Shaban is a machine learning scientist at the AI for Pathology Image Analysis Lab associated with Mass General Brigham and Harvard Medical School. He earned his PhD in computer science from University of Warwick, uh, focusing on medical image analysis. Primary focus of his research is developing advanced algorithms for critical clinical applications in computational pathology. So Shaban, thank you very much for joining us today. Before we start, do you have any preference on how you would like to take questions? Um, yeah, I think it's fine if we ask questions, like if you ask questions during the presentation or at the end. So okay. I think I'm okay. Fine. So thank you very much. Let's uh, everyone. Let's try to make the session as interactive as possible. And without further ado, let me hand it over to Shaban. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. And uh, yeah, and also for the kind introduction. So yeah, today I will present uh, one of my publication, which is published in Nature Communication. And oh, I just like slightly modify the uh, talk, uh, like title of this presentation, which is like cell phenotyping in highly multiplex imaging through machine learning, right? So in this talk, first I will talk about uh, uh, like, uh, more about like what's phenotyping and then what are the multiplex imaging, then I will state the problem and then uh, uh, like one slide on related work and uh, followed by uh, like the detailed description of the data set, the model and the results. And at the end, I would like to present like a couple of future directions that I also really want to like discuss with, uh, with the audience and get, get feedback. Okay, so the first thing first. So now the question uh, is like, uh, what is cell phenotyping? So in, in theory, like the cell phenotyping is the process of characterization and quantification of complex molecular interaction within cells. But in technical term or in, in term of AI, it's basically a problem of classification where we want to classify cells into different cell subtypes. And like there are uh, there are different cell phenotypes and it basically depends on uh, on the tissue type and also on the project and what are the aims of project so for a specific uh, project we can define um, a certain number of cell phenotypes but co common cell phenotypes are like t cell b cell macrophages and then there are also like some subtypes which are like m1 macrophages m2 macrophages so it it really depends on who is doing the project and what's their end goal is and what type of phenotypes they are interested in. So now the next question is like, uh, like why cell phenotyping is important? So the cell phenotyping is basically the key step to understand the tumor microenvironment. And then uh, like if we understand the tumor microenvironment, then we will be better able to understand the disease model and also we will be able to like uh, discover new drugs. And uh, this will also help us to uh, understand the overall uh, the, like tissue microenvironment and also to uh, like reveal the new fundamental biological mechanisms. 
So now we know that like, okay, self, you know, oh, what is self, you know, typing and, and why it's important. Now the question is like, how, uh, like, can we do self, you know, typing with the H and E images, which are basically the most common stain uh, these days. And it's also a like gold standard for medical diagnosis. And with this, uh, with this type of stain, we can clearly see the like cells in a tissue and also the structure. So now the question is like, can we do self phenotyping with H and E images? All right. So the benefit of doing self phenotyping using H and E images is like there are uh, there is like so much publicly available data set like TCGA and CPTEC where we have like thousands of full slide images uh, from different mm, tissue types and also different cancer types. So so the issue is like. Uh, with the H and E stain, we can only see like kind of super cell types like uh, epithelial cells, immune cells, but uh, it's not really possible or it, it, it's kind of hard for, for a pathologist or for an expert to basically label cells into a specific phenotypes like let's say T cells, B cells, uh, or macrophages. Uh, in some case, cases, it's possible, but it's not possible for all the cases and for all the cell phenotypes. So therefore we need something other than H and E images, right? So that is basically the multiplex imaging. So in multiplex imaging uh, images, we can simultaneously visualize the multiple markers or molecular target within the same tissue sample, right? So, so we can also consider like H and E image as a multiplex, but in this case we on, we have only like two plex images where uh, we have two marker. One is hematoxylin, which is a nuclear marker, and then eosin, which is a cytoplasmic marker, right? But for uh, for cell phenotyping or for detailed cell phenotyping, we really need like way more than two uh, two plex image images, right? So there are several technologies which enable us to do like up to like 60 plus uh, markers. So we get uh, get images with 60 different markers, right? So, and then the benefit of those is like, instead of just having an H and E image where we can see the like cell or perhaps the tumor cells or immune cells, uh, with these type of technologies, we will be able to see like different types of cells, just like in, uh, in the image on right, you can see, like the overlaid image, you, you can see different colors where each color here is representing a specific marker, just like the orange color is perhaps representing cell membrane. And then the green is basically representing the cytoplasm. So that's the benefit of these uh, like multiplex imaging technologies. Like it enable us to like visualize the same tissue with, with the different markers. So let's say if we have 10 different markers, so we can choose different colors for each individual marker and then analyze these. So this is kind of one of the uh, like visual analysis, but obviously we can do oh, like automated analysis as well. So the most common technologies for multiplex imaging are like codex and maybe. And codex is basically a fluorescent based imaging technology which support up to like 40 plus markers. And, and it basically work in a, a cyclic manner where they try, uh, they use three antibody and one nuclear marker to uh, like to, uh, for, for a specific uh, sort of uh, marker, right? So, and then they do this thing uh, attractively every time they use new set of antibodies to mark a corresponding region. So, and then the maybe is also like, in, in general it's same, but they use uh, like a different technology to, to image the images. And in this case, they like image all the antibodies sim simultaneously. So now we have the technologies to like, to get the data in uh, based on like different markers, right? So we still need some way to like label those markers in in like in some specific phenotypes. Here we need like uh, expert knowledge. So so pathologists usually based on different markers they usually label uh, uh, label each cell 
either uh, like from a predefined set of uh, phenotypes. So in this case, let's say we have like B cell, CD4 T cell, CD8 T cell. So so let's say for B cell, they will they will be interested in like okay, if this cell has a high CD20 uh, expression and also the PEX5, then they will label this thing as a B cell. And then similarly for all others, so they have they know that okay. If there are like that markers are high, then we will consider uh, this cell of that specific phenotype, right? So now the in so now the problem statement is this: like okay, the cell phenotyping uh, is important for tumor microenvironment understanding, and then we have the uh, like technology to do hyplex imaging so that we can uh, understand the tumor microenvironment. But uh, to do the cell phenotyping, uh, we need some way. Like if we try to do the manual annotation, like if pathologists try to annotate the cell phenotypes manually, then the obviously the issue will be the subjectivity and it will be a like labor intensive task. So just imagine you have like 40 markers for and for each cell you have to like analyze those four uh, like expression of, uh, of 40 markers for each cell and then you have to decide this thing right so to automate this thing the one obvious solution is like okay we can use the machine learning and uh, because machine learning has been used in many other uh, imaging modalities and especially in HID images it has been used for like uh, cell classification or cell labeling so with machine learning, we can easily reduce uh, or medicate, uh, mitigate the subjectivity and also reduce the labor intensiveness. And there are like different approaches within machine learning. So in the existing literature currently, we have like uh, four, like two different approaches. One is like uh, unsupervised method, which basically leverages the domain knowledge. So let's say if if we look at uh, this expression matters and we decide that like, okay, we will only focus on cell expression. And if it's high uh, for like a specific uh, combination of cell marker, then we'll assign this. So then just based on this uh, set of uh, metrics, we can uh, develop some probabilistic model that will, that can assign the uh, cell phenotype to a specific cell, right? The other option is like, we can see, uh, we can, ask the pathologist to label some data and then use that label data to train supervised method. So that's the current lit uh, literature on cell phenotyping in multiplex imaging. So, but the issue with the current methods are you know, like unsupervised methods are usually like fast, but less accurate. On the other hand, supervised methods are, are like relatively accurate, but they are like computationally uh, expensive. So given these challenges, we decided to like develop a new computation, uh, computationally lightweight method for cell phenotyping in multiplex imaging. So then obviously uh, after developing this method, we evaluate that method on number of different data sets and also using different evaluation metrics. Then we compare it with the existing methods uh, like both existing supervised and unsupervised uh, methods for the same cell phenotyping task. So in terms of data sets, we have uh, like five data sets. So three uh, are like our in-house data sets and two uh, coming from one was coming from uh, a public source and other one is coming from a collaborator. So, and out of those five, three data sets were maybe data set and two were uh, codex data set. So, and then again, out of five, three was classical Hodgkin lymphoma. One is like diffuse B cell lymphoma and one was colorectal cancer. So the reason we are using like three classical Hodgkin lymphoma uh, data set is basically the, this work was part of a bigger study where we, are interested in like to understand the tumor microenvironment of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So they, as part of this study, they want us to like do the cell phenotyping first and then do the downstream spatial analysis. So here, here is a like brief summary uh, of the data set. All these data set varies in, in term of number of markers. So uh, it varies from like minimum, we have like 22 and 
and we have up to 49 markers. And also in terms of phenotypes, phenotypes also vary from nine to 16. And the reason they vary, uh, uh, like the reason we have different number of phenotypes is basically based on the data set. So data set coming from the public source has a different label. So we, we have to rely on that. And then the, our internal data sets also have some variation in, in terms of cell population. So we adjusted the number of phenotypes based on the available uh, cell count. So just like in uh, histology images, uh, like we, have, we usually do like pre-processing. So similarly in multiplex imaging, we also have to do some sort of pre-processing. So in histology images, usually people uh, do like, uh, people usually develop methods for like uh, tissue segmentation or uh, bra like uh, blood removal or uh, imaging artifact like tissue folding. Here in this case, the challenge is a little bit different. So here the first challenge is basically uh, we have to remove like channel crosstalk. So we, uh, channel crosstalk is basically the sig uh, channel crosstalk occurs when signal of one source contaminate to uh, another source or another chan channel. So here I have an example where you can see the, at the bottom left, we have one image and then uh, which is basically contaminated by another channel, uh, which is in the middle. And after uh, we use a like existing algorithm to get rid of this uh, channel crosstalk and at the end we can get the like green channel which where you can see like the cell uh, which was uh, present in the contaminated image or was not uh, present in the clean image. So that's kind of one, one type of uh, pre-processing that, that we did in this project. So uh, the next Shavan, can I can I interrupt yep. you right here? Here, a channel is like the RGB channel, or it's the different uh, markers that are being used. Uh, okay, so actually there is one difference from um, this, uh, like these images, and then the H and E. In H and E images, we usually have RGB image, right? So that's a color image. So, but here we have like kind of grayscale images where intensity value range from zero to up to a, a specific limit, right? So each marker, let's say if we have a, a image with like 10 marker or 20 markers, so it means we will have like 20 different uh, channels uh, in the image, right? And then uh, while imaging, they, they are basically using uh, like some sort of uh, technology to capture uh, the light, like uh, the frequency range. So sometimes they have like these kind of issues. So, that's why we have to like kind of uh, remove this this thing. So just to clarify, you have if you have twenty channels, you've got twenty images, and you're using Rosetta to eliminate the cross talk between those twenty images. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. So it it's basically like this. So so actually, there is another important thing like. Uh, whoever is looking at the images should have the domain knowledge as well. Like uh, I like this was my first project and I don't really understand most of the images because my pure background was H and A images. So we collaborated with another lab who work in this images a lot. So they basically managed to figure out these kind of stuff. So for me, perhaps like the, the even the contaminator channel looks fine because I don't really uh, understand the biology, but they know that like, okay, for this specific marker, there should be only these few cells which are bright should be there, but for all other cells, those are maybe lymphocytes or some other type of cell, they should not be there, right? So they then they decide that, okay, there is like channel contamination. So, But this uh, algorithm is kind of generic and it's part of the pre-processing pipe, pipeline, but I'm just explaining that like, uh, this is kind of way. So with the domain knowledge, you will be able to know that like, okay, in this channel, we have some noise, either it's uh, like noise or it's a uh, channel cross talk issue. Okay, thanks. So, okay. So the next challenge, uh, challenge was like image noise. Even here you can see like there is some like really sparse signal. So that's basically kind of image noise. So, 
so this is the place basically when the, uh, when our collaborator approach us and ask us to like okay can we do some sort can we use like some sort of uh, deep learning based method to get rid of the uh, this noise issue so when i look at the images i thought okay it's kind of like perhaps if i just do like background foreground seg segmentation that will be enough and that's what i did i just use like a uh, unit based segmentation method and obviously for a uh, unit method is a supervised method. So I asked them to mark some ground truth. So what they did like uh, to, let's say if we have this image, so here uh, the noise is like really, really sparse uh, like signal. So what they did, they use KNN based method to cluster, like to see that, okay, if there are, there are enough uh, as, like intensity, high intensities in a region, then it's a, like a true signal, otherwise it's a, like a false signal, right? So, but they did this thing with the kind of manual, manual correction. So at the end, they provided me like few images. So then I use those images to train the like unit based model and we get even better results than the KNN based methods because obviously unit, uh, like uh, units basically learn the overall kind of uh, like a data distribution and then figure out that, okay, all these uh, like sparse signal uh, or pixels are basically the noise. So we will get, you know, like we was able to get a much better uh, noise removal method as compared to CNN based method. So that um, was another, uh, uh, sorry. Another question here. So again, this unit based segmentation, you're doing it for all of those 20 markers separately, right? Yeah, yeah. So in this case, yeah, uh, basically what I did, like instead of training a uh, unit bit mar uh, like marker, like if instead of considering one image with multi mar multiple marker as one, I consider each marker as a one image, right? So which basically increased the data set size and and, and also like uh, kind of add the diversity in model training. Thank you. Yeah. So, and yeah, then yeah, that, I have one quick question. Like, uh, do you have annotations for that? Like manual annotation for that? So basically, let's say if you have this image on the left, which is our original image, right? So if uh, obviously it's really hard to mark the precise right. annotation. So right. then the obvious, like if someone asked me to mark uh, like uh, annotation for this. So the obvious thing is I will uh, figure out that, okay, if there are like some pixels, like kind of sparse response, then I should like get rid of this. So they use like key and base method, like, okay, within a certain neighborhood, if the overall intensity response is really low, which basically mean, okay, that's, uh, that's a, uh, that specific pixel is kind of bad. So they so did you this. created mm -hmm. the annotation automatically? Uh, it's semi-automated because obviously KNN method did not really perform well in all the cases. So what they do, like they they do this thing as an initial step and then they manually correct these, like they manually remove all those regions where they think that, okay, this is not part of uh, that true signal. So, and they did this thing for like, I think 20 something images. So then I use all those 20 images and then uh, train the model. Okay. And um, actually, like, uh, the uh, problem is pretty simple. Like, even right, usually... Right. That's what I was thinking, right? Like, pro, do you need an unit or if can KNN with manual correction works? Well, yeah, so... Just use the thresholding, yeah. Uh, yeah, but then that will be, like, kind of heuristic. So we have to kind of fine-tune for different images. So in this case, it will be like, okay, we have already feed the uh, images to the algorithm and algorithm can learn some distribution and then manage to like predict background and point. Okay. How does the expert know which are false positives and how do they detect false negatives on these images without looking at the H and A? Do they look at the H and A? Uh, so I so in these cases I don't think so they use H and E. So most of the time it's basically uh, they like use multiple uh, like they uh, they usually uh, consider a, a multiple marker at the same time to figure out that like which uh, cell is this. So this is how they usually do like while when they was like 
annotating i was like sitting next to them and they were like okay can you like highlight that many marker and then if they are not satisfied then they, they said okay let, let's highlight another combination of markers so from that they figure out that okay this is uh, the right cell or this is the right signal so this is how they kind of annotated basically for the self phenotyping they really did this thing okay thanks so so the next step is like uh, cell segmentation so basically because we are interested in cell phenotyping and basically the end goal of the project was to understand the tumor microenvironment and then obviously to understand the tumor microenvironment they are first interested in like the different cell population so for that we need some sort of like cell labels and to get the cell labels we first need to locate those cells so for that we use like cell segmentation so instead of like training any new method we relied on the existing like published method which is deep cell so we used that met method to do the cell segmentation and that method works really well and it takes uh, like nuclear uh, marker and also the membrane marker to do the cell segmentation so here is the sample result. This result is from the actual paper, not from the art set, but uh, this this is what we basically did. So uh, like we feed the both channels and then we get uh, the cell segmentation results. And from the cell segmentation, then we did the downstream cell phenotype. So, so now the next so now uh, at this point now we have get rid of all the imaging artifacts and uh, we also get the like cell localization or cell mass so so the next step is to basically we decided to convert these cell ma mass into a cell expression matrix so obviously we can work on image level but then we thought like okay if the end goal is to assign labels to the cells so why not just work on like uh, at, at cell level. This will be like computationally efficient as compared to working on image uh, level. But then it also has a drawback that doing this, we will be losing like the special sort of uh, information that we have in the images. So what we basically did for each cell, we calculated the mean expression value uh, using the cell mask. And then let's say for a given image, if there are like K cells and N markers, so we end up getting like K by N uh, expression metrics, right? So after getting this, along with this, like now we get the expression metrics, but we also need the label. So for, uh, for labels, pathologist annotated the in-house data set. And what we did, we again did, some sort of uh, like uh, semi-supervised approach. So what uh, they did like for each uh, cell, we have the cell expression metric. So they you they cluster that cell expression metrics, right? And they do the clustering and then they explore each cluster. Like if that cluster have only similar type of, uh, like the same type of cell or like the cells falling in one phenotype. So they label that cluster as a specific phenotype. But if there are like, uh, multiple uh, cells from multiple phenotypes are there, then they do like uh, further clustering of that cluster. So this is how they iteratively uh, annotate or uh, mark the ground truth for our data. So at the end for our in-house data sets, we managed to get like the other larger data set have like around 1.6 million cells. And for others, we have like above 100K cells, which are like reasonable to evaluate uh, the proposed method. So, so, all right. So in terms of method, because one of the aim of this method uh, is on like, uh, this study is to like develop a fast method and also the accurate, accurate. So that's why we decided to like use uh, like rely on a simple multi-layer perceptron network instead of using some image-based uh, network like CNN-based network. So that was one of the reason. Otherwise, like we have, uh, like there is one existing method which perform reasonably well, but it, it's computationally really a sort of expensive. So what we basically did, we take the cell features or like and feed this, uh, feed the cell features along uh, 
to to this uh, multi-layer perceptron. So in cell feature, we consider the cell expression matrix of all the markers plus the cell size, just to give uh, another information. Like okay, uh, because there are some type of cells which are uh, large as compared to other type of cells. So this is kind of overall flow diagram of the method. So we have like uh, we have the like images with n different markers. We during pre-processing, we convert those images into cell expression matrix, and then we uh, we feed that cell expression matrix to multi-layer feed-forward network, which then um, like uh, output the cross probabilities, then which we converted into like class labels. All right. So in term of experiment for all our data sets, we have followed a five-fold cross-validation approach where we use four folds for model training and optimal model selection. So basically out of four folds, we use 80% for 80 cells for model training and remaining 20% for validation or optimal model selection. And then we use the optimal model to for evaluation on the uh, fifth fold, uh, which is basically the test set in this case. So, how much total? How much total data did you have? How many training cases total then? Yeah. So in term of a uh, number of cases, it's not like many. One of the reason is like multiplex uh, images are like really expensive to get. And but in terms of number of samples, one of the data set are like really large number of samples. So, but in terms of uh, cases, I think there are like the largest uh, data set have I think twenty cases and around fifty ROIs, like mm -hmm. region of interest. Well, I'm just curious if you just compared this using a conventional machine learning method, you know, like Lasso, or um, Logistic, well, depending on the classes you have, you know, another regression, just a regression type technique since you have limited data. Uh, yeah, that would be, yeah, perhaps, uh, yeah, ideally we should have reported those results as well, but somehow we just compared with the uh, other multiplex imaging methods, which uh, which are published like relatively recently. Okay, but yeah, I really agree overfitting. with- Overfitting, you know, consider you, you know, would overfitting be a consideration with your data set size? Uh, yeah, actually I will discuss something about this at the end. Uh, okay, so in terms of uh, like uh, performance uh, evaluation, we use like uh, standard uh, evaluation metrics to evaluate the uh, our classification model. And then in terms of uh, like performance, we got like reasonable F1 score, which is like around 80, uh, which we think oh, like basically uh, while working on this, it's all about uh, like on the pathologies, they, they said like, okay, 80%, like uh, F1 score of 80 is reasonable to like move on to the next step, which is like the downstream analysis for the, uh, using this method. So that's why we like we think like okay that's fine. So and then the other uh, thing that we want to explore that like okay uh, the accuracy is eighty, which basically mean we are also getting some misdetections or like false predictions. So we use confusion metrics to to explore those, and then it turns out that like those mis uh, misclassification usually. Uh, in those cells which are kind of relatively similar at a broader level, like CD4 T cells and CD4 A, uh, CD8 T cells. So, so most of the confusion are between those cells which are like similar in some sense. So, but we also have like uh, some sort of uh, misclassification in the other class, which we added to basically and all, all those cells which uh, which fall in some some sort of artifacts because in our data set like some sometimes some cells are really hard to or, like classify due to some sort of artifacts so then we decided that okay we should have like other class to like classify all those cells which don't really fall in our uh, predefined list of cell phenotypes so and then we also kind of compare 
the prediction with the ground truth. So basically what we did, we generated uh, the Z-score based like cell expression uh, matrix where on the x-axis we have the markers and on the y-axis we have the cell phenotype. So if we use the ground truth labels, then then the B cell for B cells, we have like high CD20 and PEX5. So we did the same thing for the prediction and then we found a like kind of similar pattern which kind of indicating that, okay, like the uh, cell classification is re uh, reasonable. So then the next step uh, was to like compare with the existing methods. So we compare with two existing methods. One is Oster, which is unsupervised, and another one is cell Citer, which is supervised. So here we can clearly see that like the unsupervised method didn't really perform well across different data sets. So we, here we are, you know, they present results of four different data sets. So the other method like cell Citer, it performed relatively well compared to Oster, but it's still, its performance still lower than our uh, map our method. So uh, here are some visual results, which are perhaps not easy to understand in this case, but if we just look at the last column, which basically highlighting the predictions, uh, like uh, highlighting the cells, which are uh, cr classified correctly only by maps, like our method, they are like highlighted using pink color and then the cells which are only correctly classified with the cell citer, the other uh, supervised learning based method are highlighted at green. But in general, like the classification performance is reasonable. So especially for the downstream task. So that's kind of one of the aim of this thing, like have something reasonable for, for downstream. Okay. So uh, once we have like these results, then uh, one obvious question was like, we are basically the other method like cell setter and Oster, Oster, we train those methods on our data set, right? So which obviously mean that like, okay, maybe we haven't really put enough effort uh, to optimize the parameters. This could be one of the issue. So we decided to compare the results of our method with with the existing public uh, published results of cell cited. So here you can see the results where MAP still outperform cell cited, but there is another interesting thing, like these results are basically an ensemble of like 10 cell cited models. So basically they use, uh, like they, they train 10 different uh, models with random initialization, and then they took the ensemble of those 10 models. But uh, compared to this, we are using just like one model, which is also computationally. So, and then to further highlight this point, we also calculate, uh, like we also compare the computational efficiency of, of these methods. So in terms of like overall time, Aster and maps are really fast compared to cell Citer, which take uh, quite a long time to do the inference and then uh, more importantly, this thing is only for one model. So they propose to use like 10 models. So you can imagine like the time will be like 10 times of this. So that's one of the reason we decided to like develop our own method instead of relying the existing uh, supervised learning method. And then in terms of memory, uh, Aster is taking uh, less memory compared to cell Citer and MASH, but they are uh, relatively comparable. Uh, memory requirement. Uh, but in terms of GPU memory, uh, Oster and MAPS have a lower GPU memory requirement compared to cell Citer. And one of the reasons is like cell Citer is image based. And basically, uh, cell Citer is basically a ResNet model where it takes an uh, image of 128 by 128 pixel and which is centered on each cell. So let's say you have an image with 1000 cells. So it will generate 1000 patches out of that image and then. Uh, do the cell phenotyping. All right. So now then the other thing is like one of our data set is like have so many cells. So so we decided to like train the model with the lower number of samples to see that like whether that thing impact uh, the model performance or not. So here we use like 
5% of the training data, 10%, 20%, up to 100%. And in terms of results, there is not much difference, especially for uh, 10 to 100%, but there is like slight performance decrease for the 5%, which basically mean like if we have a reasonable a large data set, then we can use this method uh, for like self phenotyping. Okay, so in terms of limitation, one of the limitation of this work is basically uh, when we evaluate the model train on one data set uh, and tested on the other data set, the performance wasn't uh, really high. And then what we did, we also compare other method on in exactly the same way and we observed similar performance, uh, like similar pattern in the performance degree. So then, uh, so it could be now, now the question is like, why we are getting like so low performance, it could be overfitting, like the limited generalization, or it could be due to the lack of standardization between different uh, data, uh, data, data sets. So because the uh, multiplex imaging technology is like relatively new as compared to HND, so it's still lack, uh, uh, it's still lack the standardization. And then the other, a uh, sort of limitation of this work is basically it's based on multiplex imaging, which is like uh, the overall data sets are much smaller, but uh, it's really costly to acquire. And also it requires a lot um, large uh, storage requirement because if we have a multiplex image, with, uh, like a whole thread image with mul uh, multi multiple markers, then it could be like up to 100 GB. So these are uh, like the current challenges with, with this new technology. So now the question is like in like in terms of future direction. So now the question is, can we do self phenotyping using HND images? So the point is like, uh, if we can do uh, do this thing with HND images, then obviously we can do it. Uh, self phenotyping, so many different tumor types, so many different tissue types. So that's a plus point. But then obviously to do this, we really need to have like a paired data so that mm, we can train a model using the h and &E images and then use uh, multiplex imaging uh, as a ground truth. And actually there are like some uh, data set, mm, uh, like the paired h and &E and multiplex imaging data set available. So that could be one potential project uh, that someone can like, work on. So, and then other option could be like these days, like different people are developing different uh, like foundational models. So recently, and there was two foundational uh, H and E image based foundational model published in Nature Medicine, where uh, like they train the model on like. 100, uh, 100,000 whole slide, uh, whole slide images. So if we use the features from those foundational models, perhaps it would be more useful to train, or like more easy to perhaps train uh, some course phenotyping uh, method where it will, like instead of phenotype a cell, we can then label uh, a patch or a token uh, in, uh, in these like models. So the other future direction could be like, so currently we, the data set I have used to have like around 20 to 40 markers. So now the question is, can we do cell phenotyping with uh, low plex imaging? Let's say only seven markers and perhaps we can. So one option could be like, if we have an image with seven markers, we can use those seven markers to mm. predict some other markers and then we can do the cell phenotyping. So these are two potential future directions that uh, that mm, someone can investigate. So, and in terms of the paired histology data set, I have just listed here the publicly available data sets where we can both find multiplex imaging and as well as the histology uh, uh, histology images. And there are also some work on marker prediction where they, they are trying to like uh, predict like more markers just from some base set of, uh, like small set of uh, base markers. 
so that that's uh, that could be a good starting point if someone is interested in the second future direction so yeah that's all from my side so at the end i would like to like thank uh, my lab members from mahmood lab and also the members of young lab and also my uh, clinical collaborators so okay. if you have questions please please to all Thank you very much, Raban, for this interesting presentation. Everyone, let's give our uh, speaker a virtual round of applause. And then please go ahead if you have any questions for our speaker. So for your uh, for these samples, were these, what, what kinds of lesions were these? Were these lymph nodes? Were they solid tumors? And were, were how large of a, a sample was on the slide? Was it the whole lesion or part of the lesion? So basically, these are region of interest. So the actual, uh, I can tell in like in pixels, it's like around 2000 by 2000 regions. And those are like mostly classical Hodgkin lymphoma uh, sort of cancer cases. But um, we do have like some reactive lymph node samples as well as a kind of uh, control, but mostly the samples are like uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Samples. Yeah, no, but, but do you have a sense for like how large was it? An so those cases, lymphoma cases, presumably that was the lymph nodes. Was the entire lymph node included on the slide or only part of it? So initially uh, I remember like they, they have H and E images. So, for, and then they extracted these uh, ROIs and then they did the multiplexing on the ROIs. So, Originally, they have the whole section, but the analysis is only like. I the, see. It's only segment. I ask because of the issues of tumor heterogeneity across regions yeah. of the lesion, um, which could affect your results. It'll be interesting to see, you know, if, if taking a different ROI is, is there any difference in your um, performance and these statistics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so currently it's like uh, we are relying on the expert knowledge to select the uh, ROIs, but obviously the one potential future rejection could be that what if we, let's say if you have the H&E uh, image, right, and you know that like, okay, this is a classical Hodgkin lymphoma case. So it is possible to predict some a high attention or like some hotspot region with the H and E images, and then we can do like further analysis uh, using the multiplex imaging. So that's uh, could be one of the interesting project. Actually, I think we are working on it. Uh, any other question? Yeah, I have one question. Could, could you go back to the uh, your flow, di uh, flow uh, diagram for your network? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this one, settled expression matrix. Um, so I did, is there some kind of thresholding involved in this step? Uh, so uh, no, actually, so once we have the cell, uh, mm -hmm. like cell mask, right? So then each cell uh, uh, expression is basically the uh, mean value of pixel within this cell mask, right? So okay. this is how we generated the cell expression metric. Okay. But during like there are other few some uh, like uh, basic pre-processing steps where we clip the values which are like too high or too small based on uh, specific markers. And we also did obviously the normalization across markers. I was asking because uh, uh, earlier you were saying that you didn't rely on a KNN based clustering technique uh, because it's kind of heuristic based, right? So you would need to have like some threshold to do the noise removal. So I was just interested to see if you used any other uh, heuristic, but you're saying it's the mean value of the Yeah, it's, the cell mean, pad, so. uh, it's pretty common. Like people usually use like mean cell expression uh, for this cell expression metrics. So we did the same. Uh, I think Ramon has a question. Ramon, do you want to go ahead and ask? Hi. Yeah. Um, so uh, it was mentioned that you did some pre-processing for 
to work with the channel contamination. And I was just curious, um, how sensitive are the multiplex methods for some processing variability? So would we see some large difference in expression values? Like, let's say, similar to how we see that there's a, some staining variability in the h &E imaging. Yeah, so I think these steps perhaps impact the uh, performance of the downstream tasks and it could be possible that like one of the uh, like the reason we are getting poor performance on uh, like uh, on cross uh, data set evaluation it could be due to like these different uh, pre-processing steps so yeah so that's the issue with this thing so, so the uh, i think the ideal a uh, scenario would be like if we have enough data set to train a large model, like something like the foundational model, then we can easily get rid of these things, like uh, these kind of artifacts. Basically, when we have enough data, algorithm will learn to ignore these kind of artifacts. So that's one of the things that someone can also like work on. Currently, uh, um, there are like so many foundational models, almost like. All for all almost for all image modalities except multiplex imaging. So soon we will see. Maybe for this one, the only issue is like for multiplex imaging, we don't really have really large data set because it's really expensive to collect the large data. Set. Yeah, I think we have another question in the audience. Hi, um, I had one question. So each data set has um, like its, its own number of channels, right? So it could be N yeah. uh, markers. So do you train a new model for each data set? Because obviously the matrix um, will be will be different sizes depending on how many markers you have. So yeah, in this case, uh, we use like, we train a separate model for each data set. Uh, but at the end, uh, actually, when I was like, get this data set, so I, I use all the markers for model training, but later I realized that like we perhaps don't really need all the markers because uh, out of those 40 plus markers, there were like around 20 markers, but like functional markers, right? So those uh, we currently, we don't uh, know their role in cell phenotyping. So ideally we just need only these markers for a cell phenotyping of these uh, uh, like cell types. So, okay. but it's still, so currently there, there is another issue uh, is in, with these kind of, uh, it's it basically not a kind of like issue. It's just a, a way people train the model. So if we train the model in a, in a sense that let's say we fix the number of markers, then obviously uh, we, if we want to try the same model on some other data set where we have some missing markers, then obviously we will, uh, face the performance like degradation. But what if we train this model in a way that where it's not sort of bound to have like all uh, possible markers. So it's like, just like transformers where we can use like variable uh, input, right? So if we train a model in a way that where we can feed the variable number of markers to the model, then perhaps we will not face this issue. Then model will be like robust. Great, that makes sense, thank you. So yeah, and, and this actually I'm working on something which, uh, uh, and then the issue is like, I cannot really use the existing pre-trained models. Uh, and one of the issue is like, usually all those pre-trained models are trained for three channel images, like RGB images, but here I have like N channels. So it's kind of challenging to use the pre-trained weight. So I have to like use or uh, like train the model from scratch. Uh, we don't have any more questions, then uh, let's give our speaker another round of applause. And uh, okay. thank you very much, Aban, for joining us and for this interesting presentation. Uh, we'll upload this on our YouTube channel uh, okay. and see you guys next week. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for inviting me for this. Thank you. Uh, talk. Bye, everyone. Bye.